I'm an engineering graduate, and then four years down the line, I was like, this might not be it. This is not where I want to be. Certificates doesn't mean that you're knowledgeable. You have those type of people that do things one time and then come talk to you as if they've done it for millions of years. I don't need to be what people expect me to be. I don't have to meet everyone's expectations in life. What should they focus on to be a high performer? One thing. This episode is filled with so many great stories. Assam explains to us how he got liberated from feeling ashamed of saying, I still didn't understand. He explains to us how he learned to seek and ask for the information he needs. He shares with us his journey and his career that was led by curiosity. All right, before we kick off this episode, if you can press the subscribe button, that would make me a huge favor. It will help me bring you more and more great minds to this show. This is the High Performance Mindset, and today's guest is Assam Al Ismaili. Enjoy the show. Assam, I read a quote from you, and it says, It's never too late to reflect, rethink, restart, and run towards your goals. What's the story behind that? Are we starting that way, eh? <laughs> I think um, I came into a realization very later in my life that I'm not what I, I don't need to be what people expect me to be. Mm. And I don't have to meet everyone's expectations in life. And uh, I'm not perfect, and that's normal. Uh, we've been taught since our childhood that we need to get the highest grades, we need to become the top of the class. Uh, we need to sit in the front of the class, we need to listen, we need to study hard, we need to do everything in a certain way and, and achieve perfection. And that was the goal. Even if you missed a mark back in high school, uh, it was a big taboo at home. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I missed a mark, I missed two marks. And then you, you go into life and you realize with all the ups and downs, every time you get down, you start feeling depressed, you start being angry because you were never raised that way. But then later on, I started realizing that this is normal. And, and sometimes it's not bad, because I've done it twice in my life that I left a job, I went to another job, paid less, but then it opened 10 other doors that I did not expect. So I'm, I'm an engineering graduate. I started with an engineering you know, career, and then Four years down the line, I was like, mm, this, this might not be it. Although I was good at it, and I was good in doing everything required, but then I, when I foreseen what, where is it going to take me, I'm like, no, this is not where I want to be. So, what do you mean by that? Because when, when I was pushing my career through engineering, and I met a lot of experts next to me, and I realized that there is a limit of how much you can grow within the engineering field. Today you learn uh, to do a certain programming code using a certain language. How much can you cope with the changes in technology within the next 10, 15, 20 years? There is gonna get, you'll get to a time where خلاص, and you are not gonna be able to catch up with everything that's coming out within technology. So I was like, no. And we will not be able to catch up with all the version. How many courses will you go to? How many uh, certifications will you go get? How many re-examinations you'll go take? So I felt, no, this is, not, this is not the thing that I'm aspiring to get to. And I needed to, and in my head, I was like, no, no, no. For me to get to a position where I become a CEO of a company, I need to change. So I flipped. So I changed from Dubai. I came back to Oman, paid less uh, than what I used to. But then it was a completely shift. So now from engineering, I'm moving into marketing and product marketing. So it had some engineering elements in it, but... It's changed. It's different. You're looking at uh, you're looking at the product from a different angle. From an engineering, you're just developing a small section. From a product, you're looking at the whole story, mm -hmm. and then you take it from there. And then from there, I started changing again, moving to a different department. Was Back there a specific reason why you moved into marketing? The specific reason was when I when I I saw that shift between engineering and marketing will be the best fit How? for my character. 
understanding who I am or trying to understand who I am, am I good only in programming? But then I can talk. I, I'm, re I'm a really good communicator. I can think. I have ideas. So the shift was me trying to see if, if I can blend them both. So I did the blend. And it worked. It worked really well. A couple of years learning different product management, some uh, project management courses, learning here and there, getting all of these kind of knowledge that I was looking for. And then I realized that, oh, there's something missing within the course of my career. Which was? I was like, oh, I, I know how to design a product. I know how to think. I know how to put the main ideas forward. But I didn't know anything about putting a business case or you know, setting up the financials of my product so that I can defend it on my own. I can mm -hmm. build it, mm -hmm. Which you talk have to about it, yeah. and defend it on my own. And I know the numbers, and I can foresee the future, and I can put a five years estimation and three years estimation. The one thing that I've learned since, you know, uh, and I'll say not in high school, and not in the first few three years in college, probably in the third or fourth year in college, is that don't be afraid to ask again. We go back to school, whenever the teacher stood in front of the class after the class and asked, did everyone understand? We were all quiet because we were going to be slapped <laughs> if we said we don't understand. And this happened to us in, in our development through the years since first grade till the 12th grade. Every time a teacher stands and says, Fahmin, you understand? We're all like, mm. no one talks because we know that we, we've, been, we've, we've dealt with that scenario where if you said, I don't understand, can you repeat? You probably stand up, humiliated, hit. All of these scenarios was, it was in our heads. And, and you can see that till today. You can see that effect on our generation till today. Oh. When you go to work, when you run a workshop, when mm -hmm. you run a seminar, when you run anything with a big group, if you ask the question, do you want me to explain again? No one will raise their hands because they all went through the same cycle. Yeah. But then if you go and ask the person, then what did I say? Can you repeat what I said? What did you learn from what I said? They will get stuck. It's the fear of, of, being, of, of being seen like a stupid person or like not, you know, uh, not understanding. Although probably no, none of them understood, but Everyone is afraid to ask first. But this is definitely, I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but it's definitely easier said than done. Yeah. So I'll tell you how did, when did that switch happen? Between 2004 and 2005, university. We need to do our uh, summer internship program. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the chance with a couple of friends of mine to be taken out for an, in a student exchange program. So I was taken from a man, Jamastan Qawus, and, and taken to Czech Republic. And uh, some Czechs were coming to Oman. So it was an exchange program. And in Czech, it wasn't in, in the main city Prague. It was somewhere at the outskirts of Czech Republic. I learned in, the, in those three months more than what I, I learned in the university in the three, four years that I've done. The challenge was standing for yourself, standing on your own, mm -hmm. and asking for stuff and demanding to get stuff on your table. Otherwise, no one is going to look at you and no one is going to give you any, uh, you know, support. So the first day I came in with my colleague, the professor came in and just gave us a piece of paper and said, this is your project, an A4 paper. You have to design this, a circuit this, that connects to this, that can measure temperature from outside. We're like, okay, good. And then he left. Didn't talk to us. There were two PCs in front of us. The PCs although it was 2004, 2000 and 2004 period, the pieces were on, win were on doors, not on windows. Okay. It had a floppy disk, not a CD drive. Da -da -da, it was missing everything. It was in Czech, not in, uh, English. Not in English. And we, I couldn't work. The first week, I was just looking at the PC, and the PC was just looking at me. And then I said, okay, maybe I should ask. Then I went and asked. I said, I need a few stuff to work. He said, okay. He gave me a sticky note. He said, write it down. What do you want? So I was like, okay. 
I need a CD drive, I need a better RAM, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. So I put that and I need Windows, whatever, 2000, English edition. I need this, I need this, I need this. So I gave it to him. He's like, okay, on Monday, you'll get them. Came on Monday. They were all there, but scattered on the table. So the CD drive was on the side. The RAM was on the side. The installation for Windows was on the side. Nothing was set up for you. So what should we do? We should fix it on our own. So we disassembled the, the PC. We started fixing it. We started installing and removing. And you knew how to deal with the hardware before? I No. And the university never taught us dealing with the hardware. We just came into the lab. Yeah, the that's laptop, a different, the uh, PC was there. Yeah, that's a different degree. <laughs> exactly. So we had to. So now I had to check YouTube, you know, some, some forums and see, oh, how does this go there? Oh, be careful doing this. Get the steps. But at the end, we managed to make it work. It functioned. Okay. Now uh, you realize that you did not ask for the Microsoft uh, Office suite, so now you have to ask for it. Can I get that? Yeah, you can get it. Ah, okay. You did not ask for the program that will help you design a chip, so you have to research and then ask for it. So the process itself was not come, sit down, everything's ready, you know, uh, be quite comfortable and deliver. No, it was all opposite. around. If you don't ask for it, we're not going to give it to you. And you have a time limit in your project. Mm. So we learned to ask. And then we realized that when we asked, we didn't only get the things that we want, but we also got a tip, a hint on how can we find faster ways to get the project running. Okay. So we got information and we got more information and knowledge so then i realized i was like when i finished those three months and i went back to the university and i start, i wrote my report my first report to the university was like thank you for teaching us nothing and the report went on and on and on on all the things that the university needs to change so that we can actually become engineers not just degree and paper but then whatever i took from there i've implemented everywhere i go i keep on asking can you help me with this? Can you teach me this? Do you have time now? So now, when I got to the financial aspect and I knew I didn't know anything, I asked. I built something very rough. I showed it to a friend of mine. She looked at it. She's like, okay, you're missing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I went back. I studied. I came back. I showed her again. She's like, it's getting better. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I was done. I learned. Now I know how to build cases. So now I can not only develop and think about the idea, but I can defend it with numbers. I can defend it with facts. I can benchmark according to facts across the world. So every position that I've taken in my life was, was more of curiosity than it was a bump into a salary or, mm. or a bump into a position that you're growing. No, it was more, I'm curious. I need to understand what, what's, what's happening in sales. So now moving from product, I learned some financial aspect, building business. So you case. saw that moving into those jobs as a way of learning. Yes. But no, normally a person would be like, no, this is not my field or not my area of expertise. So I'll just try and stick with, with my lane instead of me going to, to a job that's completely different from my background. Mm. But then, yeah, a lot of people are in that, basically in that bubble. So they, they don't want to get out of my lane, my comfort. You know, they don't want to be told that they, they don't understand or they don't comprehend or they're not good enough. No one wants to be described in these words. No one wants to be told that, by the way, your presentation looks ugly. Oh, by the way, I read the paper that you made and it's bad. You have problems with spelling. So everyone gets to a comfort zone where they're really good at what they do. But at the same time, they don't care about everything, everyone else, because this is my task. This is what I do. And this is what I know best. I realized from, from those days that for me to progress in my life, I need to start getting into everyone's business and learning what they do. Did that get inspired from something before? As in getting into everyone's... Uh, yeah. Not really. I, I don't think it was inspired from something before, like coming to think about it right now. Not school, because we know the school days. Some sort of exposure? But then I've, yeah, probably the way how my parents empowered me to explore and try with boundaries. There's always boundaries. You cannot join the Maharajan festivals of the years. But you can always uh, play different sports. As long as you maintain your grades to become here, you can do whatever you want. 
And then the self-exploration happened with mingling with people. So people, you know, you know, uh, friends, you know, this side of town plays a certain type, you know, sport or basketball. And then you go to the other side of town on the beach, people play football. So you are always adapting to where you're going to. And that builds up with time that you feel like you, you, you can't. And it gets, gets to a stage where it becomes very bad because you can't, in your head, being comfort is the worst enemy. So whenever you get comfortable and you realize everything is moving very good and everything's really nice, you start looking left, you start looking right, and you start thinking, maybe I can build, you know, something. Maybe I can create something. So this is the mindset that we were brought up with, up with. during our childhood at home. Can you give me an example, like uh, something at home that maybe you feel is... I, I can tell you one, one thing, you know, back 10th grade, 11th grade, when Family Game came out and Atari used to come out and everything else. During the summer holidays, me and a couple of friends of mine, we went to a scientific club and they taught us how to fix, you know, the adapters that used to come with the, with the games. Yeah. Yeah. So they taught us how to measure, how to make sure that it's working, how to fix it if it's broken, how to change the resistors. Because it used to heat up. Because huh? it used, used to heat up <laughs> and you used to put it in the freezer. <laughs> or you used to have two. One is in the freezer, one is being used. And then every now and then you give it a break, you change, you put it back in the freezer. So when we learned that, it was like kryptonite. Was like, oh my God. Now the business aspect came since back then. So I was like, you know what? We can open our own electronic shop at home and anyone who wants to fix their adapters, they can bring them to us. So people used to ring bells and just drop their adapter, and then I fix it, and then they give me like two reals like for fixing it. I'm like, okay, I'm making money. And then again, so that happened a lot during high school. So the first time when internet came in back in the 90s, and we got the torrent uh, websites, LimeWire and everything else. Napster and the Yes, Napster and everything. What, 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 what was I doing? We had a double-deck uh, cassette radio audio. Yeah. And I, I think probably my father, he brought in Umar. the first cassette where you can, which had a cable and adapter that you can connect to your uh, PC and then you play music here, it plays on, the, on your system, right? So what did I do? I converted that. I used to download new music and I used to play it on the PC, it plays on the audio and I recorded it. On the tape. Yeah. And, the I, cassette. and I was selling the cassette. My parents didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I used to do that a lot. And I used to fix these video games and I used to fix these adapters. And then... And this business aspect of doing the entrepreneurship side, yeah. basically. Did you see, did you, like your dad used to do that, your mom or anyone? No, not really. It was just very inquisitive. Like, okay, I, mean, I realized that if I do things good, people pay me. So I used to do hand uh, bracelets. You want me to write your name. It's close to your whatever birthday. You want to gift someone a gift. You want to make a heart. I used to make them. Okay. Like, and I had people with me in, in my room. My neighbors, the guys, we were all making them. It's like one real, two real, three real. So we, we got okay. to do stuff and we sold stuff and we made money. Yeah. And then the money goes into picnics and doing stuff uh, fun during the weekends. Yeah. For that aspect, mm. with everything else around our life, we, we don't say we had a, a you know, very difficult life. Like our life was very comfortable compared to our parents, compared to their parents. Of course. But we always had that, you know, uh, the, the experimental part in our head that says, you know, we should try, we should do, we should, uh, uh, you know, we should sell, we should talk, we should bargain. And that was built during that period of time. And this is what I'm trying to even encourage my kids to do today, you know, and, and, and I keep pushing this narrative to their heads all the time. What is one of the ways you feel you're pushing them to be more experimental? And well, it's, it's, uh, it's rather a harsh way because I have three boys. One is 13, one is 10, and the other one is two. Oh, wow. So I sat with the 10 and 13 because we usually have conversations in dinner. So I tell him, uh, who pays for your clothes? It's like you, dad. Who pays for your school? It's like you. Who pays for electricity, water, and everything? It's like you, you, you. I'm like, okay. So listen, I'm paying for that. I'm paying that for you now. Me and your mom are paying that for you now, so that when you get into college, 
or before getting to college, you start making enough money because I'm not paying for this child's education. And that's their younger brother who's two years old. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not paying for this boy. Very good. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, I'm paying you guys. I'm investing in you so that you can make enough and pay his education. So then the question, they'd be like, how? Like, you have all the options in the world. You can create YouTube videos. You can be a cook. You can be whatever you want to do. I don't care. Find a way to make money before you can clean my car every week. But then find a way to make money before you graduate, before you finish school. Don't waste time. And you don't feel that uh, they're too young for that? No. I feel that the way we're trying to raise our kids now is not to depend so much on, on the grades, especially now, back then. Yeah. We had opportunities because our grades used to take us somewhere and then we did something and then we got jobs. Right now, if the grades and knowledge is not enough, you need to have skills on the side. And, and without these skills, because you never know when, when, when will these skills save your life, whether from a living point of view or from an adventure point, whatever it is. So you need to build both aspects. They need to be good in terms of knowledge and acquiring knowledge and, and applying knowledge. But then they, they need to have real, you know, life skills. They need to know, they need to train, they need to jump, they need to fight, they need to get into all of these aspects in life and they need to fail and try and come again and fail so that they understand that they have alternatives, they have other ways. What, I, what I love about it, uh, I totally agree with that, but I also really love that you're also injecting that uh, responsibility, sense of responsibility. It's paid back really well because the past year I was in Saudi Arabia. So I was working for a whole year in Saudi Arabia. And the house was just my wife and my kids. So my kids had to step up. Their father's not there to change the bulbs. So the younger one picked up the stairs, changed the bulbs. The father's not there to clean the car. So the other one picked the cloth and cleaned the car. Not perfect, but they're doing it. They're in it. And, and they're pushing themselves at school and they're helping out at home and they're babysitting and they're cleaning and they're making sure. For that paid off, it seems that they've, they've got it. Now I know that tomorrow when they graduate and they get something, a scholarship outside, most definitely they will be able to take care of themselves. And this is, what we are, that's, this is where we want to get to as parents. We want to make sure that it's not me, it's not my wife, but they can become their own men and each one of them is very different than the other this is also something that we had to realize that we can't raise one the same way that we raise the other we have to talk someone in a different way than the other this guy understands when you talk to him directly this one will always ask questions until he's convinced and you have to be prepared for both and the third one is coming with all of his questions it's like and you know these two are very different and and their expectations of life is very different so you need to know how to maneuver around both so that they can both be aligned, so that they can both work together. So being a parent was also a big and, experimental part. And during this one year that you've been away and you came back, oh, of course you've been coming back and forth, but what do you feel um, developed in them? Well, the older one, I mean, for since the beginning of yeah this year, he was, and this is one thing that we've done throughout when he was a kid, we used to put them in different activities. So he tried Taekwondo, it wasn't for him. He was too kind. And you know, Taekwondo, you need to be hyperactive kind of person so that you know you have the aggression that you can kick and hit someone. He used to be hit and then he used to look at us and, and shrugs. It's like, no, 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 that's not the way. If he hits you, you hit him back. <laughs> so the coach was like, mm, maybe not. Okay. We took him, put him in a different sport. Chess worked well, okay? So he has intellectual level to, to play chess he needs to continue so let's put him there and let's see how he does swimming we saw him really really good at swimming like okay this is it swimming is his it factor so you need to find their it factor so when I was in Saudi he took swimming seriously he trains every single day for two hours a day swimming he's been doing competition just last friday he slashed all of his prs by 10 seconds average wow 50 meters 100 meters 200 meters he did a 400 meters everything 10 seconds 10 seconds 10 seconds that's that's huge. and he does it with passion it's a different it's not forced 
I did swimming in Sultan Qabu Stadium. I hate it. I still hate swimming because of that experience. But he does it passionately. He's so excited about it that, you know, he doesn't feel it burdening him. He doesn't feel a burden to go to swimming classes or to follow the instructions or to do labs for hours. The younger one, we're doing the same experiment. He's now doing kickboxing, which he's enjoying. He did swimming, but we felt swimming for him is just to learn, and that's enough. It's not something that it seems that he's going to accelerate. I would say let him continue doing swimming because swimming increases your stamina. Mm. It forces you to be very attentive with coordination. Your coordination goes down, you go down in the yes. water. Yes. Right? So, yes. You, so once you get this coordination in any form of martial art or, or boxing or it would really come as an advantage. And you see it with a lot of prime uh, uh, fighters. Uh, yeah. See in the last fight, let's say, uh, before the f- last fight of uh, Adesanya, before he won, uh, uh, what's his name? Pereira. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he really incorporated swimming. So yeah, I would definitely say mentally, it really um, forces you to stay calm. Mm, mm, mm. You, you don't have a choice, <laughs> regardless of your personality. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so he still does swimming. Okay. But not competitive. Mm, mm. No, his brother does it competitively. Yeah. And he's, so the brother found a niche. So he's good in swimming. He's 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 a really good drummer. Mashallah. So music instruments for him is easy. So he's learning now drumming and guitar. So okay, two things, three things, four things. He's good at school. He's good at, uh, you know, his subject. Uh, he prays. So we're building that foundation. How do, uh, how do they manage their time? And this was the, the toughest thing for us to, to build in them. It was really tough. And it's still tough because we still need to be on top of their heads to make them understand that time is valuable. So do not waste time. So right now we are there to support them. Like my wife is there all the time. And he, God bless her, she, she put a lot of effort uh, into the kids. And, uh, they come back, all right, guys, go pray, get, get ready, start So what studying. is their routine like? Daily routine? Time-wise. They wake up by themselves. Uh, so going to school for them, that's another thing that we, we made sure, that going to school for them is fun. Interesting. Not the same. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like if the day, yeah, and they fight for us, they fight with us to go to school. You know, if you're not feeling well, you're coughing and yes. you're like, no, no, you should stay at home. They're like, but I have this today. When, no, when? <laughs> I would fake a cough <laughs> and they'll still take me to school. <laughs> you have to faint until someone picks you and goes, I'm not going to go to Yeah. But they, they, they love it. So was it always like that or it changed at some point? No, so we made sure to pick the schools that, that brings the, the, the aspect of engagement and happiness around the, the way they teach, how they teach, how they treat people, how they mm. treat students. So throughout... How do you, you're able to decide? It took a long time to decide. It's honestly like we put them in a school and then we see like the first school with, that we put them in they were really, the, the, the English curriculum part was really good. And the way they taught the kids was amazing because we went, we saw, we see them coming back happy. We see them waking up on their own, wanting to go to school happy. We see the books that they give them at school. But then we had a big issue in terms of they're learning more English the Arabic's than Arabic. Neglected. And then I thought, you know, maybe it's the school mindset that are pushing more English stuff than Arabic. But then I went to school and then I realized, no, the teachers who are at school teaching the English part were more passionate about teaching than the teachers teaching the Arabic part. Okay. So the Arabic part did not care if the kid didn't know how to read. They, they came with the old mentality of, I read, you repeat. Mm. Yeah. The English part were like really super. Every time they do something, even the smallest thing in the world, they like encourage them, you're doing amazing, you're doing beautiful. You know, uh, we, he has the worst handwriting, but then they'll still encourage you, they'll push you, they'll give you that positive, that positivity helped so that they loved school. And now I don't wake them up. I, I wake up, they're downstairs 
bags ready. I'm like, okay, get into the car, let's go. I mean, I'm driving you to school, so let's go. So they love the aspect of going to school, meeting friends, making friends with the teachers, getting to do activities, doing their swimming, doing their music. So this is part of their DNA, and this is something that they know. They, they, even in the holidays, they will still wake up at the same time, six, seven, they're awake. Because this is part, this is built in. And uh, going, going to sleep? Eight, nine, done. This has been from day one. Eight, nine, done. The older one now, nine, 9.30, because after swimming, he needs some time, so he's, by 9.30, he's going to bed. So it's built in. That, that system is there, and they've adapted to it. And we didn't introduce technology in their life until a later stage when we were able to control that technology. And this is something that we've made sure that we are able to completely control whatever device we give them in terms not only in content, but only also in time and days. Like this tab will only work at a certain time at a certain day and certain hours. They hated it at the beginning. Hate, 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 hate. And then suddenly they adapted. So now they know to manage their time with their devices. I'm going to use this now. Yeah, because at the beginning, they're fighting the addiction. Yes. So, so the beginning, withdrawal yeah. symptoms are kicking in So until, until they it settle. settles. For now, it's not an issue. If you tell them, give me your device, you'll not hear him screaming or yelling. Or At the beginning, it was there, of course. Yeah, at the beginning, they were like, oh, no. At the beginning, the device shut down after two hours. And they're like, <laughs> what kind of device is this that shuts down after two hours? It's it. And it says, your time is over. What do you mean our time is over? <laughs> Isn't this our device? Yes, it's yours. But, but you can't work, you can't live with the device all the time. So then until they start learning and understanding that, okay, and now they have laptops. So even with their laptops, they are better than, than others that I see, but they, they control their time between how much time do I study versus how much time do I watch entertainment. Yes, they do mistakes, and we all do mistakes all the time. And we keep on reinforcing the aspect of the importance of managing your time. You have tests coming, so you have to manage your time. You have competitions coming, so you have to manage your time. And let, or otherwise, we're going to cancel you from the competitions or something. So then they realize, ah, okay, no. So it's, it's a balance, which I believe, <clears throat> yeah, until now, we're doing uh, uh, an amazing job. And I, I've seen a lot of parents do the same thing. And I feel it's, uh, it's a system that we all need to you know, uh, try to install in our next generation because these are, these people, they, they're going to grow differently. They're not going to be us. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that. We grew differently from our parents. They expected something from us. They wanted us to be a specific in person, way, yeah. either a doctor or an engineer. <laughs> What were you? <laughs> me, uh, my dad used to always call me doctor. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm more open to, if he knows how to play football, Maybe this is it. Now it's completely different. Exactly. Because right? our days, like, um, yeah, dad was very, uh, all of my brothers, we all uh, excelled in uh, sports. Anything to do with being an, ath an athlete, we excelled in it. Mm. But, uh, yeah, we knew anything to do with sports is not an option as a career, which makes Makes sense. Back in the days. Back in the days, there were no options. We didn't know. We didn't know the options. Also. I mean, but actually, our, our countries didn't didn't have the system. Didn't have the platform. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so it makes sense. Platforms were there outside, but we never knew how to enter those. How platforms. are you gonna exactly? How how would I <laughs> you know? What should I play here that will be good enough there so I'd be taken? You know? I mean, from our generation, the only one, I guess, who actually left completely out of Khadija's uh, Al Habsi. Professionally. Yeah. And probably. by coincidence. Exactly. Oh. And it, it took him it was time later, yeah. To convince it was later and it took him some time to convince his parents that this is a career. <laughs> yeah. This is the mentality. This is where we come from. No. It took him some time. And then now Now look at the others that are coming and trying to, you know, follow his footpath. All right, let's let's go back in time. Yes. Around the same period. Okay. So in 2003, you were in college, and you guys, in your final year, you came up with the first mobile game. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
<laughs> was me, Ali Bimani, okay. Ibrahim Siabi, and Mohamed Blushi. It was, uh, f- we entered the competition for fun, honestly. Didn't expect to win, nothing. Like, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. It was the first competition organized by Oman Mobile, which is now Oman Tel, and they call it Gamers. And back then, the devices were the Nokia, you know, snake kind of screen. And if you have it colored, you know, those are kind of Big Java. League. Yeah, old Java really? games, you know, very old kind okay. of things. But the challenge was to come up with a concept that incorporates something from Oman uh, to something that is fun and, and adventure. So that if it wins, uh, it can be selected to be developed and sold into the market in Oman. Okay. Okay. We, of course, you know, the four of us were quite excited. We're like, okay, we sat, we planned it out. We've had sessions. We've put like, I think, 10 ideas. We've scrapped them out. Eight ideas. We've scrapped it out. Six ideas. So we came to the final mm-hmm. idea, like, okay, we're focusing on this. Uh, and it was called uh, Fort's Adventure. It was a mix between... You remember those, uh, the, the first game we played in the computer, Prince of, uh, of Persia? Persia. Yeah, you remember that? <laughs> it was a mix of that, you know, blended with, with it being in, in Omani forts. Okay, nice. So before you enter the stage, it gives you a history about the fort itself. Uh, this, this uh, you know, this is happening now at Qalat Bahla. This is the history of Qalat Bahla. And then you start playing the game. Of course, it was better in terms of uh, graphics and so we created the concept, and the final day, I mean, they had in the, in the uh, uh, and I still remember this till like yesterday, like five teams were presenting their concept, and, and the winner was going to be selected by the audience through an SMS code where you send group one, group two, group three, group four. So the more people send message to Votes. support you, the 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 bit the bigger the chance for you to win, and then it was displayed on a screen as racing cars. So, and it was like a two minutes window. So in two minutes, once they start, people started sending message, sending message. I think our car was almost before the last one, and then the last few seconds it started picking up. And we're like, no 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 no, it's picking up. And I'm like, no no, it's picked up and it picked up and then it just went, and it crossed the line first and nice. it was. Crazy from there. Amazing. <laughs> it's, I think someone, one of the guys still has the video till now. It was, yeah, you know, the, you know the feeling of winning? Of course. At that kind of, you know, Dr- adrenaline. adrenaline that you're jumping up and down, you can't control yourself. And, and it, it, was, it was such yani, an amazing experience. And, and the people who are against us are still friends of ours until today. Yani. And I still remind them every time that I beat you and they remember that we beat you one day. <laughs> That also had opened up a lot of things in our personality. Trust Because we, we had to go to China to sit with the developers over there who are going to develop the game. So we won the competition. Yalla, four of you, go pick your bags, go to China. Okay. Okay. Nice. China's mentality is totally different than our mentality here. Of course, you know, the cultural shock, meeting people, you know, looking at them, seeing what they do was just out of this world. But the experience of meeting people from uh, the biggest, you know, uh, firms that built games back then, Gameloft, eSport, you know, they were there. And just sitting with them and just listening to them talking about the gaming industry was just out of this world. How much effort they put into designing games, building games, you know, making sure that it's perfect. It's out of this world. And the discipline this is where, you know, the Chinese aspect came, the discipline, the commitment of being at office on time. By 12 o'clock, everyone is out of the office having lunch, napping on a stool at the street. By one, they're all back working side by side. And, and I asked this question once to one of the executives. I'm like, because it was a small table, at the size of this table, and there were like four people on the table, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. And, and I asked the question, I'm like, do they know each other? And he said, no, they don't care. They're not here to know each other. They're here to work. And I'm like, okay, maybe that's a downside that I don't want to do. But then 
it was interesting to see that we went to factories where they started with 10 employees building mobiles and now there are 1,600. We went to, it is out of this world. So that opened up a lot of, you know, question marks, exclamation marks. And something that I keep on telling people that we are not, yeah, we, we, we're still, we still don't have any significance in this world. We lost our ability to create, to innovate, to be independent. We're consumers. We consume everything. We use everything that everyone gives us, but we never create something that we will use to inspire the world. Or people will actually use our products and say, wow, this is, this is, this is amazing. Where is this coming from? And that is putting us in a very, very difficult situation. And this is what we see. This is what they see. This is the situation around the world. We're being pushed into boundaries where we discussed this before, where we're not tested now physically. We're not physically weak. We're not, uh, you know, wealth, uh, wealth kind of weak. No, we're being pushed in a mentality aspect that we see things happening around us and we feel hopeless. We can't support because we're mentally being pushed to a direction to show us that you're weak. So the, the, the biggest, and this is, this is something that I keep telling people, this is the biggest fight that we have today is not the physical or the strength fight. It's the mental and the thinking and the creativity and the innovation fight where we need to move forward and start making things or creating things that the others will start using. Others will respect us. The others will give us a plateau or a platform so that we can showcase that this is what we created. Now the world needs to use it. And we need to get to that stage really fast because, you know, this is where... How do, how do you see that happening? It's a different uh, mindset that needs to be installed from top to bottom, bottom to up. It's, it's, uh, it's a way from... It's, it's a mindset where you sometimes need to stop things for some... I mean, because you, you have to design it according to the societies. And there was... Um, there's a nice book I think I read that when the whole world, and this happened very recently, when the whole world stopped, you know, the Chinese from making chips, chipsets with a certain specifications, they just launched, uh, Huawei just launched a new device and they disassembled it and they realized that they designed and they built their own chipset with a specification that no one expected that they would be able to build today within two years of their. So I think sometimes you need to corner people in a, in a position where you don't have, if you don't think on your own, you'll not get what you want. We're too comfortable. Mm. Everyone is too comfortable. Even us, we're too comfortable. We're using, everything's available. And, and we're getting to a comfort zone where it becomes even bad because I know people for a fact that moving from one destination to the other, although your brain knows where is, what are the road and what's the path to take, they will still use Google Earth and Google Maps. You go to this place every day. So it's like me going to work every day, but then I will still use Google Maps. Why do I need Google Maps? Don't I have, no. Maybe for traffic. For traffic, you check it once and then that's it. It's yeah, like, that's you it. know, this yeah. is your route. So we need to move away from just being dependent on everything else around us because they're available. We need to use these things, but then we need to also think, what if? So what, what are if, the things we can start doing to start cultivating that mindset? Or do you I feel? think it starts from, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it's a certain age that you need to start from because you can start from any kind of age. But then developing these or pushing the mindset or promoting the mindset of creativity with a proper marketing campaign around the, you know, around the country, developing platforms where people can go and create stuff. And then when they create something, you reward them on that creation. Yeah, that's very important. So that they feel that they are, you know, rewarded. They feel that they're, they have Appreciated. appreciation somewhere. That helps in, in, in building and developing. And you showcase them to the world. Right now, what are we showcasing in our social media? It's all jokes and products and, and consumer and everything else around it. But inventions, where are they? Creativity, where are they? Uh, people who invented, uh, who won a couple of competition in, in inventions, what happened to them? Where are they today? Why are they not still, you know, the main discussion? Why are they not comic books about their, their great achievement and how did they get there? Because you need to create a story. You need to create a narrative so that people can always repeat and say, that guy did it. This guy did it. 
Even Ali al-Habsi, we all know his story. It can be a nice comic book where kids can read it and, and fall and in love with it, it yeah. and, and follow his footpath. But then we need more of these. We need more success stories being shared everywhere and talked about everyone. And then you create the right platform so that people can go and try and learn. You know, why aren't we creating our own devices? Is it, is it something wrong with us? No, maybe we lack some kind of knowledge. Let's try. Why aren't we doing ABCD? Let's try. Why aren't we doing our own softwares? Let's try. And also pushing the, the, the thinking around, don't be afraid to fail. Because, and I notice it's within the region, when you always try and tell someone that I'm going to start something new, the first thing that comes into their mind is that he's going to fail. We, we look at that cup half empty, like you're going to fail. Wait, you're going to fail, and you're going to find a job. Okay, so, and why is a failure something very bad? Why well, it's not looked at as part of the process. It's not looked at part of the process. Why is it, why is it something bad? Why is it taken as, a, as, a, you know, uh, as something that is very negative? It's a learning process. I didn't do well. I learned. Now I know what I need to do next. So tomorrow, if you ask me to repeat the same thing, I'll not do the same thing. I'll change. And I'll do it differently. Yes, I might have lost money. And, uh, but I, you need to change that. I think, I think um, that's a very good point regarding the process, right, and sticking with the process. I think a lot of that comes from uh, the perception of... Uh, Overnight success. What do you think about the one percent concept? The one percent concept. Can you remind me what was the one percent concept? So the one percent concept. I got to know it through uh, the Atomic Habits book, mm, 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 mm. and there was uh, the British cycling team. They weren't winning any medal in cycling for almost a century, almost hundred years. They were now winning any medals until a lot of um, cycling related brands stopped supporting <laughs> supporting them because people start they're scared that people start associating you know losing with the British cycling yeah. team till this coach came I forgot his name he said I want to improve everything that has to do with cycling even if just by one percent the grip the seat how the cyclists sleep you know, brought a psychologist involved. He went into every detail trying to enhance it by even 1%. Now, after within, I think within six years, they started winning back-to-back, -back, you know, Olympics uh, medals. And now if we go back, anyone else would be like, like, I can just imagine in the same team, a lot of people would be like, yeah, but what's, what is it worth to just add 1% of improvement? But I learned this 1% of improvement, honestly, from my pursuit of uh, Iron Man, and I'm still pursuing it, still didn't get there. <laughs> Every 1% counts. Yes. It counts. You know, when you do, if you're going for a 1K run, you will not feel it. You know, you go for just a 10K maybe cycle, you'll not feel it. You know, you're swimming, I don't know, 200 meters, 300, you will not. But when you're going now, you're talking about serious endurance and you're going this serious distances, those 1% either will really bring you down or that 1% will really bring you up because it gets accumulated. Yeah. And then the compound effect hits in. Now, going back... A lot of us look at a lot of high performers or high achievers. We don't understand it the was process. A, the process was cumulative of so many one percent being built up over time, and there is no shortcut mm. at all. There is no hacking the process. I am all about working smart, but do not think that working smart will get you off the hook from working hard. No, not at all. I mean, like you've mentioning this now, and I remember it then. Everyone wants things fast, even in our society. And they believe, and there is a big belief around the overnight success kind of thing. I'll put my money into this, this stock market. Tomorrow, I'm winning. 
the, uh, so people, I'll build this building and this is uh, going to be rented. I'm going to make money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make money. So, and then they get shocked that it's not that easy. And then they get shocked when they, and they get depressed when they start losing money. Mm -hmm. And they get upset because now I'm going to blame Hisham because he came and he said, you know what? You could make money. Hisham didn't say that you can make money overnight. He said, you could make money if you start doing ABCD. And then, you know, this happens and then it accumulates and then they stop believing in everything. And now they become detractors. So now they're like, anyone who wants to try, don't try it. I've tried it. It's bad. And I had this when, because uh, throughout, the, throughout the past 10, 10 years, you know, coaching uh, CrossFit in Oman, I had people like that. I had people who used to come to the gym, like their first class, and then they pay and then they disappear. They never come back again. The problem is they were going to other people and telling them that I've tried CrossFit and it's bad. As if they've done it for a, a long period of time, a yeah. significant amount of time. No, they've just done one class. So what I used to do is that and people who used to come once to class and, and disappear, I'd call them in a week, tell them what's happening. I don't see any classes like, ah, oh, I'm busy. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm like, okay, can you come collect your money back? And he's surprised. I'm like, what do you mean? Collect my money. I'm like, I'll pay you back your money because I don't want you to tell people you tried. You didn't try it. You came to an introduction class. We were just warming up. You did not try anything. So please give me your bank account. I'll send you back my, your money. Thank you very much for coming. All to avoid the aspect of like, I don't want you to be the role model or the example that you will go around and tell people, I tried it. It worked. I can easily come and tell you I've tried triathlon. And I didn't try it at all then. Or I did it once and it wasn't a good experience. I probably ran, I couldn't cycle, I couldn't swim. <laughs> you have those type of people that do things one time and then come talk to you as if they've done it for millions of years. And I had a lot of people who used to come and say, okay, if I start today, how long will it take me to get a six pack? Like, you think six pack will come from here? No, you need to fix your kitchen first. It's a process. It's everything around you. You talked about the 1%. Your 1% doesn't only involve your workout. What time do you sleep? What time do you wake up? What's the first thing you put in your mouth? What's the last thing you put in your mouth? Your mood of the day, how, you know, everything else comes up to build to that 1% progress that you're looking for. Probably at the beginning, because you're at the beginning, you'll see a lot of, you'll, you'll see big jumps in your numbers, but then you'll get a stage where it starts. Plateaus. Plateaus. And there you need to st still find the courage to pursue that 1%. Because now it's very different. It's like seconds. It was, you know, 15, 10 seconds of, of you know, of improvement. And now it's millisecond of an improvement. And you're like, yes. And people look at you, why? It's like, no, I've slashed my number by three milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But to you, that's a big thing because it didn't come overnight. It came throughout the process. And I remember there was a story about, I think it was Van Gogh, uh, one of the artists in New York, sitting in a coffee shop. And he was scribbling on a tissue. And then a lady came to him and said, like, can you give me that tissue? Like, he, he kept it, just threw it. He said, you need to pay me X amount of money. Like, it was a big amount. And she was like, what, for a piece of tissue? He's like, whatever I wrote here was an experience that I've gathered throughout my career. So it doesn't matter if I do it for a second or two. It comes from me, how, much, it how much effort, how much it took me to get to this stage to do this. So... He built himself to a stage where he knows the value of what he's done and he knows how he got to that stage and he realizes that that process happened with time and you start maturing with time and you start getting more experience with time. My problem now with our community is that, and, and not all of them, we start forgetting sometimes that we're, when we compare us, and that's why I like sometimes to do to, you know, I used to like when, when expats used to come to my gym and, and work out because we had a set of people that thought they're superstars. And then an expat who is an average Joe in his country comes in and then just wipes everyone out and cleans them out and then just leaves. And they're like, like yes, because you need to realize you're nothing. You really need to come to, a, to a, an acceptance that whatever you achieve, there's someone somewhere who's done better than you. And you need to calm down. This is, uh, this is this is um, this we see it in so many uh, so many fields where a person would have the potential to 
continue growing, right? They could be playing, uh, you know, tennis or paddle or whatever sport or football. And then they would stick to one club. Because they're really good at it. They're really good at it. They get their credit. And everybody, the applause, yeah, everybody's every clapping. Applause, everybody everybody in the name, neighborhood. Yeah. And I control everything. You know, I have so much influence. Exactly. You know. Today I'm not coming. No one comes. Today I'm coming. Everyone comes. <laughs> <laughs> But and then they, you've already reached like the maximum of that club or that league's potential. Now the next thing is you have to get out. Yes. You have to get out and you have to do it quick. You can't let so many years go by and, you know, and then, yeah, you know, now I'm 28 and I'm thinking, yeah, maybe, 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 <laughs> no, Habibi, yeah. uh, most probably that, that train is gone. And then, and then the, how they treat others now becomes an issue. Some of them, Absolutely. Some, of them some of them will treat you, will, will, will make sure that you know that you're nothing. And they don't feel it, by the way. And sometimes it's it's yeah because they keep staying at their same league or same comfort zone, right? Killing it, yes, right. But on the same level, with the same people, with the same people, <laughs> the same you know? place, <laughs> and it's just feeding their ego. Mm. And the only way your ego is going to get humbled is if you go and step up to uh, the next level. Yes, and try. Yeah. And you have to go into a level where you're the most you can get out of it, out of yourself, is getting in the 50%. That's or less. Otherwise, there's not much growth. If you're going there and you're already killing it like 80%, then what did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Like, there's not much growth for you or development. And you have to, this is, this is unfortunate, like a lot of, A lot of people in different talents in Oman. We have so many talents. Yes. So many. But this is the big... They like staying within their environment, within their families, you know. That's where they can preserve their status. That's But where they can preserve their ego. Honestly, I've seen it from a lot of... A lot of Omanis coming out of Masqat who come and work in Masqat. They come with a different mindset. Mm. And they grow quick. They grow quick. And then the, some of them... Even after getting used to Masqat, you know, um, one of my coaching clients moved to Masqat, had to move back to uh, Wilaya, mm. right? She was ready to sacrifice, you know, reshifting, getting an apartment, you know, furnishing it and all the work that comes with it just to keep um, moving up in her career. And then after that, she got promoted again and came back to Masqat for a bigger But she was ready to do the sacrifices. Most people are going to do that. And especially girls, like, no, very ambitious. If the rest of, you know, Oman would have that kind of ambition, you know, would have been far. Yes. And that, that has to, which I really like what you said, you were driven by curiosity. Yes. And not about... How can I stay in my field and just continue to get better in my lane? But no, you are looking at it in a, a bigger aspect. Another thing I liked is, I'm not sure when did you do this. When you were in uh, Czech Republic that you went to the highest peak? Yeah. yeah how, a... how did that happen? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> no stamina, no strength. Nothing, you know, it was, uh, I, I used to only play football, that's it. The guys who were with me from different countries, they're used to it, they're Europeans and they used to go and they hike and they climb. And they, so one day they were sitting really close to the weekend and they're like, okay, you know, they're sitting together and like, and I passed by, I'm like, what are you guys doing? I was like, oh, we're planning on the weekend to go to Lisa Khora. Like, what is this? It's like, oh, this is the, you know, highest peak in Czech Republic. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. I'm going to join. It's like, no, 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 it's Sami, Sam, no, 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 this is the highest peak. No, okay, then I'll join you. It's like, no, but, you know, it's, it's difficult. You're like, yeah, I play football, it's okay. It's like, I play football. <laughs> you see me playing football? It's harder. I'm really good. A mountain can't beat me. It's like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to do it. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's say, okay, okay, no, I think it's... And they're like, okay, we'll start from here. It's 11 kilometers up, and then when you realize you're up there, That 11 kilometer down, it hurts. <laughs> mm. 
So we went as a group, and they were really asking me those questions all through the way. Are you sure? By the way, if you get tired, you can stop anywhere. We can come pick you up later. I'm like, hey, we're just walking, right? It's just hiking. Yeah, yeah. By the way, if you get tired, no. I'm like, come on, guys. You know, too much. So we started walking. It was nice, green trees, you know, fields. Everything is nice. You see people. You say good morning, good morning, good morning. First five kilometers, those good mornings become sure less, more intense in, in your voice. They can hear it. That you know, it's like, are you tired? No, no, I'm good. Let's go. And then you know, another kilometer, they're like walking faster. I'm like, you can move. You know, you start telling them. Go ahead. I'm coming. I'm catching up. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. And then he started walking, and I take my breaks every now and then, but I kept on walking. And then you see a mother and a child just passing you by walking, and you're like, ah, they do this every day. So I try to make excuses for every person or every persona that passes me. And then you see a guy on his bike cycling, and I'm like, and he's cycling all the way up. I'm like, ah, this guy seems fit. Okay. Every time I stop, I start looking at people. And then I stopped again, and then I saw two old couple holding hands, you know, walking. And I'm like, they're probably from the neighborhood. You know, <laughs> stop making excuses. <laughs> Until one guy, whom I can't forget till today, he had one leg. He was probably 60 plus years old. He has his crutches. Sure. And he was climbing, you know, the mountain to the peak. And he came next to me and he stopped and he looked at me and he gave me a smirk. <laughs> you know that smirk, that type of smirk, but look at you, look at me. And I looked at him. I'm like, okay, they can all pass me except you. It's me or you today. <laughs> <laughs> so I was competing against him at least. I'm like, this is no, that, come on, I have to, this guy, no. So we were on and off until I got to the peak first. And now all my friends are over there, you know, just waiting, waiting for, for you. Yeah. I'm like, wait, wait. So like, what are you waiting? I'm like, I'm waiting for someone. And then he came to the peak and I looked at him and I smirked and I told him, ha. So that was the guy I was competing with. <laughs> so yeah, I got to the peak. It's amazing. It's beautiful. But while, while you were going up, you weren't getting tired. Everything was painful. But then. What were you saying to yourself? I was telling myself that that guy will not, that guy is not going to beat me. No, that was the only motivation I had. Let everyone pass. If it's me and him in this mountain, he's not going to beat me. Let pay, I'll crawl. I would crawl to the peak, but that guy shouldn't beat me because he would have a story to tell to all of his family. By the way, you know, today I went on the mountain and there was this guy who looks 10 years, 12, no, 30 years younger than me. But then he was sitting, he couldn't do it, and I did it. No, 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 I didn't want to give him that pleasure. <laughs> you don't, so that you didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't want to be that guy in his story. <laughs> no, no, no. I made sure that he's the guy in my story. Although his situation, I still beat him. But then I started, when we start coming down, you know, because now coming down, you have to... Different, the quads, covering uh, different muscles. Oh, my God. We got down, took the train. I was silent the whole time. They're asking me questions. I'm like, please don't talk to me today. <laughs> And back to the apartment, slept the whole week, didn't come out. I was sleeping, waking up, attempting to stand up because everything was painful. I crawled to the toilet, I crawled out. No one knew about this for a week. It was just pain. But what, uh, what do you feel do you took out of it, that experience? You know, curiosity somewhat sometimes can take you to places that... <laughs> but it was... See, it was... It, Still, you know, it was something that I always can say that I've done. And, and this is something I believe in and I tell people around, around me all the time. is like our life, time is, is our moments. And in our head, there are certain moments in our life that either made us stronger, made us weaker. We cried, we laughed, we enjoyed, we didn't enjoy. And these moments, you know, comes in, in, in certain packages where you can always take them out and, and share them to people and tell them, I remember I used to do this. And then there would be a, a story behind it, and then there would be a motive behind it. And then you put it back in your box of moments. And, and you can't live today something, a moment that you lived somewhere in the past, because it had its you know, purpose back then, and it had its, its, 
it had its energy, it has its its environment, it had everything around it, and you've done it in a way, or something happened to you in a way, or something affected you in a way, that it stuck in your head, and this is like, this is one moment that I will always remember in my life, and this is one moment that I'll always cherish in my life, and this is one moment that I'll always grieve in my life. So, our life is a bar is 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 all about these compilation of moments that we put together. That we get to a stage where, you know, and, and you'll see this, even our parents used to have these stories that they used to tell us from moments that they lived throughout their lives. I remember. But then one of the stories where they were all uh, uh, first in the class, this is something that we need to investigate because every <laughs> every one of them told us the same thing. <laughs> I was They're the first the in parents. my class. <laughs> <laughs> but still, they lived moments and they had stories. Yeah. And I was very eager to create moments and to create my story. And the only way for me to do that was to be curious, to mm. step away, step out of your comfort zone, try mm. something new, you know, go climb that damn mountain, see what's going to happen to you, or open a business, let it fail, or, you know, try and work it out. If it's going to fail, let it fail, but then learn. Do this, work with that, do here, talk to that, inspire this, do that. So travel, see what's happening, work outside, worked in Dubai for like three years, work in it's curiosity. Don't be driven. You, if you want to be driven by something in life, just be driven by being curious. What's happening? Can I learn? That's I that's see? how you. Um, that's how you stay alive, right? Yes. That's how you stay young. Yeah. I mean, once, once the curiosity is out of you, and then you just need to be humble with everything. Mm. You know, you're. You don't have to show. You know, the world that you've done. Biggest thing and the amazing. Not everyone in the world needs to know that. People who are close to you needs to know, you know, needs to learn from your stories. And you realize now you're becoming wiser because now you have all of these tools and tricks that you've done in your life, and and you can just pull it out. And it's like, by the way, I've 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 been through this before. There was a situation where it was A B C D E F G. I think what you need to do or what you need to think of, not to do, what you need to think of, because you can't decide the things that they need to do. You need to just give them the the context for them to think or to, to put themselves in that situation so that they can now find a way on their own to fix their own issues or to be, to be more successful. And, and, and this, is where my, this is where I found my purpose. My purpose basically is to help myself by helping others achieve great things. Mm-hmm. So I, I get the you know, the excitement and the happiness when them, I get happy when I hear that someone that I helped or I coached or I helped or I supported or I talked to or was able to utilize even 1% of what I told him. And, and that made an impact on how he lived or how she lived or how they grew or what they've experienced. And then you become a moment in their story. Yeah, a good moment. A good moment in their story. Inshallah, yeah. <laughs> you want to become a good moment in everyone's story that they sit there and it's like, you know, one day. And you don't know who are you going to influence and who's going to influence you. You don't know. People don't know. You know. You're having these conversations with people, but you don't know who, who will just throw something at you and you're like, oh, this makes sense. Oh, this is, this is really good, you know. Suq al-Sabt in Al-Muj happens every year. I was passing by, there was a guy selling uh, date bars. It's called Tamar. And I was just passing by with my kids. And I saw him, I'm like, oh, nice, interesting. And then I walked, and then he came running after me. I was like, is that Assam? I was like, yeah, sure. Did they care? I'm like, um, remind me, please. It's like, yeah, there was a, a, a competition, and you were mentoring in that competition, and we all had to come up with ideas. And I'm like, oh, yeah, and this hotel is like, yeah, the Shada Hotel, the hotel in Al Muj. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember you were with that group. And it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, remember, I had an idea of creating these organic date bars. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. And then he said, you told me that maybe not for the competition, but as a business. Let's think about it that way, that you can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's like, I said, yeah, yeah, I remember somewhat. You vaguely remember what you said. And the guy was ex- was telling me exactly, you said this, this, this. I'm like, okay. It's like, that is my factory. Mashallah. Like, you have a factory? I'm like, yeah. It's like, that's your product. Yeah, yeah. That's the product that comes out of my factory. Wow. Uh, See, 
and, and you didn't pay attention to those things that happens, but then your intentions was always to support others, no matter what the case, if they listen to you or not, you just give them what they need for them to fuel. And you never know what will fuel their interest or their ignite their, you know, their inspiration or push them to the next level. Until you know, someone comes to you and says, you know, thank you, or someone comes to you and says, by the way, you know what you told me last time really helped. And at the same time, you don't expect, you don't want people to come and tell you this because you, you didn't do it for, for applauses. You just did it because you've been through moments where you realize now that you know where you are now, I was here and I thought of it this way, so maybe you think of it in a different way. And they took it and they moved and they created a moment on their own. They took that and they built on top of it. So now they're achieving what you dreamt of, but then they're doing it their way. But you yourself also, what, I think 2012, you started the first CrossFit gym, right? In Oman, yeah. yeah. Uh, how did that happen? It was a uh, pure coincidence. Uh, I used to run boot camp classes before CrossFit between 2010, 2010, 11, and 12. By 2012, the people in the class and... and uh, Hold up, so wait. wait. And also before the boot camp, you had went through a... a, a transformation. A yes. transformation. Yeah. And you lost around 30, 30 kgs. Yes. Marshall. Plus minus, yeah. Plus, not minus. And in what uh, period? Six months. Six, what was that like? was one of the most uh, one of the moments as well that I've always cherished it was between 2006 to 2009 I moved to Dubai and you know Dubai if you if you you know submit to the lifestyle of Dubai eating out eating out being here being there you start forgetting yourself so I was very much amazed of everything in Dubai so and it's quite an amazing experience but then we used to eat out every single day and they have a lot of good options. And they have a lot of good options, man. Everywhere, every corner. <laughs> so that happened, and and in that period of time, I went from from being like in my late eighties to jump to hundred and twenty kgs. Oh, and I didn't feel it. Jump. It's a it was big jump. Gradually. It was just gradually. It's just compiling, and and I felt it when I went to pray Juma, that I felt that I couldn't sit without a wall, so I had to find somewhere to back up my my know to a wall which and, before you never felt I, that way and I never felt that way like okay why why is it painful why is it and then I went to a doctor and they did the you know checkups and stuff and they said you're okay but do you want to die like what kind of doctor are you <laughs> okay because <laughs> they have to slap you somewhere okay it's like do you want to die no it's like yeah but if you continue this lifestyle then I'll have to prescribe medications and you know you'll get to you're pushing yourself you're pushing your body too much you'll get to a stage where it's you can't control so it's like okay i started thinking about that you know like how can i move how can i transform myself and just again coincidence my sister just walks in my room and she says my friend is trying to open a business in oman which is a lifestyle you know changing your lifestyle eating well kind of you know set up it's a different setup they don't measure your blood only, they do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna open this business in Oman, I have to try it first. It has to work on me. So I took it. I'm like, let me be the first specimen. And, and I stayed in Dubai and I did, did not come back to Muscat for a long time, like a couple of months, three months. And the first three months I lost probably 12 to 15 kgs because those you know, easy weights at the beginning that you lose. And I got to a stage while losing weight and without working out. So it was only food. That's why I tell people, by the way, you know, six pack is in the kitchen. So 80%, 75% of what you do in the kitchen is defines what defines how your body looks like. Got to a stage where I was not able to sleep from the adrenaline that, you know, your body's transforming. Mm. Your, your, everything is working. And, and I had to go out and run. So that was my first time running three months in the program. And I ran for like five kilometers, first time, nothing. No training, nothing. 
Yeah, but you play football. But then, no, I had the football, I was like, mm, on and off. Yeah, that football thing, uh, it, it messed up all our knees. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but I was back, and then I was like, oh, oh, no, I still need something. So I took a jump rope, and I started jumping. It's like, okay. And then I was able to sleep. So, so the body transformed in a way uh, that I went from 120 bat down all the way to, I pushed it, because I was supposed to stop at 75, 76. And I pushed it down to 69. 68 and and uh, uh, it was too much and it became too much and I was, ah, I was yeah, trying yeah. to I was trying to prove something to myself <laughs> but I got to a stage where I got to stabilizing so I stabilize and I finish the program and I'm done because it's a lifestyle like you can stop somewhere and then you can adjust and start including the food that you stopped tell me what was the mental journey mental journey at the beginning you know it wasn't very easy because now it meant I'm stopping all the outings with everyone else. I can't go out with you, I won't go out with you. Second thing, I'm cooking my own food at home. And I'm not only cooking, I have to weigh everything that I cook. And I have to prepare my food. And then I go to work and people used to look at me and laugh, You're crazy. It's not gonna work. Stop doing that. Let's go out. The guys are downstairs. And, and that's just fighting all of these fighting temptations, man. How are you dealing with that? I was just ignoring everyone. I'm like, no, 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 I want to stick to this. Because in my head, there was, a, there was a, a, a carrot somewhere that if I do this right and it's actually worked on me, I can open the business in Oman and it works on everyone else. Mm -hmm. So now I had a motive like, okay, this is the results. If I get to the results, I can do this yes. and I can, you know, benefit out of it. First month, second month. And then they start, they start seeing the difference. It's like, okay. I think you're losing weight. It's enough. I'm like, no, 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 I still need to do more. Third month, they're like, what is this program that you're doing? And I gave them the name because they had a branch in Dubai. Like, this is it. Fourth month, three people started join, join the same program with me. It's like, okay. And then fifth month, yeah, like fourth month to fifth month, and then the director called me in the office. She's like, stop. Doing, she, call, she didn't call me for work. She called me to tell me, stop doing the program. I'm like, why? She's like, you're losing too much weight. I'm like, still, still, I still need, I still need, I, I need to feel what does it mean to be in your, you know, 70 and 60 kind of thing. It's like, you're crazy. I'm like, ah, don't worry. And then I continued until I got to the stage where, you know, my aunt lives in Umul Kuen. She used to call me. Why aren't you coming? You didn't come for a long time. You didn't come. I said, I'll come, but I'll bring my own food. She's like, do whatever you want. Okay. But come. Okay. So I cooked my food and I went there. And it was like an intervention. So I was sitting on the chair and she was here and all her kids were around me. Because this is like the first time they see me like in four, in a couple of months. And they're all looking at me and she said like, you're going to eat my food today. I'm like, no, I'm not going to eat your food. No, I'm not. No, you're going to eat my food. And my mother thought I was doing drugs. It was crazy, like, you know, like. Yeah, when you lose like, that much. Some, you know, is it, are you sure you're only doing it from food? Yeah, yeah, it's only food. And then you see what I'm eating. This is a piece of chicken and salad. She's like, okay, but you're sure you need help? I'm like, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But the amount of confidence built up that came mm. from just losing weight and looking good. Like, I used to walk all of the Emirates. I see a mannequin wearing a T-shirt. I go inside, I change to that T-shirt, and then I go to the counter, and I, and I pull my label to the counter top, and I tell her, please scan it and cut it off. She's like, are you wearing it? I'm like, yeah, I'm wearing it now. Because I can. The amount of just confidence I can speak to anyone, talk to anyone. Right. You know, you feel good. You feel light. Started taking salsa classes. Uh, it was going, you know. It had a, a good spiral effect. Yes. In everything. Mm. People around you acknowledged you better. People around you appreciated what you do. You know, people around you got inspired. And do you think really it had to do with, uh, with how you looked or it had to do with how you looked at yourself? It's how I looked at myself. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I, we are the biggest you know, critique to ourselves. So I, it's how I looked at myself. But then how I realized that. And how you looked at yourself yes. started changing how you carried yourself. Exactly. So everything started changing. You know, your personality, the way you talk, your confidence level went like on the roof, you can speak to anyone at any place at any time. You don't care, you know, uh, who it is, what it is. And so it started 
creating, bringing a new kind of personality that I might have had before, but then this just boosted it out like, Hoss, you're out there. You know, you're free. You can run, you can jump, you look good. You, you can wear whatever you want. You can, you can, you know, get into different sports. You, I played like three different sports at the same time. It was just an amazing feeling. And, and it, it was like that. And then it came to a, uh, to a stage where your body got disrupted again. And then I had to, I repeated the same program three times. Three times in my, you know, since 2006 till now, three times. And now I'm planning to do it again because I need to bring my body to a certain point where it gets, you know, it's abnormal and then I bring it back to normal. And with age, it just, you know, it just means that I need to be more careful with what I eat. What was it like going through the process the second time? It was faster because now I didn't do it. I didn't wait 30 kgs to be gained. <laughs> I was like, oh, 10 no, I kgs. Mean mentally. No, it was much faster. It was much okay. easier. Much, much easier. You know, when they tell you, you know, when you're a millionaire and you lose a million, you can make a million easily. Yeah, same thing. When you are, if you are, you know, obese and you lost okay. weight doing a program and you knew it worked, you can do it at any time. So Cause my... Because the, the biggest difficulty at the beginning, I, I would guess from what you're saying is, is you sticking to the process while you're not sure of the results, yes. if you're going to get any results. But believing that this is something that's going to work. I'm like, okay, so you need, you need to believe and you need to stick to a process. Again, back to the 1%. And then you see the results because you're weighing yourself every week or every two weeks and you're seeing it like starting to drop and drop and your genes don't fit anymore. And you're, you know those feeling like jeans doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't fit anymore. I'm like, oh, okay, I need to buy new stuff. So I was buying T-shirts and stuff from Carrefour because I was in a process. I didn't want to buy expensive things. Yeah. I'm like, let me get there. Role. And then, and I still, till date, have one pair of jeans from the date from 2006, still with me until now at home. I keep it because I want to remind myself that I was there. And, and, and telling you, these, these, these moments in our life shapes our personality, who we are, how we treat people, how we deal with people, how we value ourselves, and how we, you know, you get to a stage where you start picking even the type of people that you want to be around, the type of people that you want to talk to, the type of events that you want to be in, the type of, you know, so you, you start realizing that, no, 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 I, I really need to make sure that I'm challenged all the time and I have that curiosity aspect happening all the time because that will keep me moving. The moment, you know, the moment I realize, you know, uh, I'm getting too, it's getting too easy. Like you said, you know, get out, go somewhere else. See if, if what you've done in one place is working somewhere else. Or maybe you'll get to that place and you realize that you're nothing. You're like, okay, now I need to step up my game. I need to study again. I need to revise again. I need to come back again. I need to be, I need to be the top of this whatever it is, sport, class, gym, club, because my mentality is I, I'm always seeking improvement and I'm seeking progress. No matter how small it is, it's just going to happen in everything I do. And this is how we, we move with life. This is, you know, me kind of trying to figure it out. Uh, um, there are so many things that are happening. Uh, and this is another thing that you need, you need to know that you can't control everything. You, you don't have control in everything. You know, time is, is, is moving you know, faster than whatever you think you want. You can't control everything around you. You can't stop bad things from happening. You can't stop good things from happening. You just live the moment. This is where you are. This is where we are now. I don't know what's going to happen when I walk outside. I don't know what's going to happen if I drove all the way home. I don't know. But should I be thinking about it? Should it be on my head? Or what's in my head now is that get your family, you know, see your kids, be happy. So you need to, you need to live that moment and you need to start realizing the next moment that you want to live in mm. and then start realizing the next moment you want to live in. And I usually tell people this because why? Because they, you know, since we were kids, we always had the, the dream or we always knew that one day I'm going to drive a car and I'm going to own a car. 
Yes. I was there, set, like 16, I'm taking my kitchen, I'm going to learn, and then by 20, I'm buying my first car. It happened. Because we had it خلاص, since then. This is visualize, visualize it. it, it's happened. So you need to visualize where is your next move or what is your next step or how are you, you know, or where are you, th- where do you think? Because I'm telling like, in this discussion with my mom, like, you know what? Probably in the next five years, we leave the country, we go somewhere tropical and we homeschool this kid. Like down years down the line. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, we just take a, a nice villa in a farm or something and then we're just going to homeschool him. And I'm visualizing it. In my head, I've, I've, I already see the place. I already see the trees. I already know the, you know everything else. I know what I'm going to do. I know where I'm going to go. I know how I'm going to run. So the whole story is in my head already. It's, it's, the whole plot is ready. And, and in an unconscious way, you're working towards it. Like, okay, for me to get there, I need to do A, B, C, D. These two kids need to be in college and university. And I need to start building up some kind of way that I can... Uh, guarantee a certain income. You don't need a lot of money, Mm-mm. but you need to guarantee that you can live a good life. I need to set this, and I said, I'm like, okay, so let's build. And then you start, you start seeing that everything starts coming to you, and you look, ah, oh, okay, this will support that, and you work on this, mm-hmm. and then now oh, this will support that, and then you work on this, and then it comes together. When is it going to happen? I don't know. But it's not an overnight thing. But the you process just, started. The process started. Okay. The process thing. started. Lastly, I want to ask you this question. If you were now to tell your 17-year-old self, what would you tell him is the ways to become a high performer? If I what to say, focus on? I would look at my 17-year-old self yeah. and be very frank with him. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, it's like I need to tell him a lot of things then. Have a 17 year old self of mine, yeah. Because it's a very critical remember, stage, you know? It's a critical stage in your life when you're 17 and you're. Stop worrying. Stop worrying of all the things that you're not able to do. And focus on the things that you can do now that will make a difference. Because I used to worry a lot. I cried when I didn't get a scholarship. And I studied in Oman. I cried. Yeah, and for those who don't know, mashallah, you no, got... No, I don't, I don't want to bring that up. <laughs> like, yeah. but you got was, A's. Yeah. I got A's. But like, got I A's. cried. I did not get a scholarship. People used to call me and say, I saw what you're going to do. I was saying, UK, US. Or, then you put in the work and everything. And it didn't happen. I cried. But it turned out to be okay. What turned out to be the truth is, wherever you are, you can be the best version of yourself, or you can decide to be the worst version of yourself. Just trust. Don't think that everything is going to come to you in a in a in a silver plate or in a gold plate, and and things are going to be okay. Just make sure that you take things in one step at a time. You become. You'll become even better than what you expected. And this is where a lot of people are asking me the same question, but then they're asking me, would you change anything from your past till today? I'm like, I don't change nothing. Because I see it the way the way it you know, the way the movie and the scenarios and everything happened, it brought me to where I am today. So from your journey, what are the things you'd say to a person who just finished the Nuya Amma? What should they focus on to be a high performer? <laughs> yeah. Forget about one thing. Certificates doesn't mean that you're knowledgeable. So don't aim for a certificate, but aim for knowledge. That's one. Don't be afraid to take risks. And I gave a lecture in the university once about taking risks at at their, you know, these new graduates that are joining university, they don't realize how much time do they have in their life. Because they come and say, every moment you spend on doing something not useful to you, you will regret in the future. 
So the moment you finish your Thanawi, and that's why I was telling my kids, you need to think of something that you do now. So the moment you think of Thanawi, as much as you're studying in college, you're already part of life. You need to start figuring out what can you do and how can you contribute. So don't waste time in you know, uh, spending a lot of time watching games that you're not, uh, you know, you don't have market share in any of the teams that you're working with, <laughs> you're looking at. You want to have fun every now and then? Have fun. Find a purpose. Find a reason. Try, 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 try. And the third thing is that there is no harm for you to go outside and seek new things and seek new knowledge and seek new people. Build a network that you will one day be able to, to utilize in the future. Because that network is going to be the one that's going to take you, lift you up. But then make sure the network that you're building are people in like-minded, people that are different, people that are achievers, the people that are... So look up to certain things that in life that people have gone through so that you can lead your life towards that direction that everyone went through. So these are the three things I think if someone just came out of Thanawi and thought of this, like put a real... That's a real. I think they're they're uh, uh, high performance. They'll make a difference and impact in this world. Hassan, this has been amazing. We covered a lot of good areas and topics from your very interesting uh, <laughs> experiences and journey. And um, the key uh, gem I feel on this conversation which I feel is part of your identity is you're driven by curiosity. That's it. I love That's it. That's it. Thanks, Assam. Thank you, Shaman. It's been a pleasure.